Okay, let's go check the mail. We can go see real quick. Come on. Come on, everybody. Let's go check. Wait, slow down. I wonder if it came today. You guys think it came in the mail today? All right. Well, I hope so. I bet the mailman came today. Okay, here we go. Let's go find it. Boy, I really hope they came today. Are you guys excited? We're finally going to get some. It's going to be exciting, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I've been waiting a long time. I've been waiting all summer for these. Yeah. Haven't you guys? You guys have been waiting all summer for these? Okay. All right, let's check. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in there? No. Oh, no. No, pizza rolls. Where's all the pizza rolls? How are we going to eat? I've been asking for pizza rolls for months. No pizza rolls. No pizza rolls at all. Ah! All right, everyone. Welcome back to ECE 2002. Uh, today we're going to be doing uh, lecture 31, which is going to cover uh, chapter 33, and if I have some time, I'm going to try to just cover the stuff in chapter 34 as well, because it's very brief uh, for that chapter, but uh, what may end up happening is that I may spill 33 over into 34, so anyways, uh, we'll see how quickly we can get through this stuff and uh, just do the best we can. All right, so last time we left off, we started talking about the Butterworth filter, and uh, we focused primarily on the second order filter and, and what it meant to be optimally flat. Um, as it turns out, uh, for the second order filter, we found that that 45 degree angle off the axis was, was optimal for that second order system. Um, when we look at the different orders of a Butterworth filter for that optimally flat, as it turns out, our poles are going to follow a certain pattern for where they exist in the, um, in the complex plane. And our goal here is to be able to create the best possible version that we can of, of trying to meet certain criteria. So what we have here is this brick wall diagram for describing a low pass filter. And once we get done with all the low pass filter stuff, it's very easy to convert all of our knowledge into a high pass filter. Okay. So what we, what we do is we set our parameters. We end up setting omega P, omega S and A max and A min. And in this diagram, as we mentioned before, uh, what we're doing is we're actually measuring loss here, not necessarily our magnitude. So our loss is just the inverse of our magnitude, okay? Um, so as we have this pass band here, we're, we're not losing as much in this region, and then we're trying to lose as much as possible up here, okay? These two brick walls uh, defined by our four parameters are what tell us what kind of order of filter to use. And they're also going to specify a, a certain omega C, right? We talked about omega C uh, in the past and what that means. Um, but it's going to specify a particular omega C. And uh, that omega C is basically going to act as a sort of I don't want to, I guess the best way to describe it is sort of an inflection point in this, in this graph here. Um, and so that acts as uh, a way for us to be able to bend around these two, while the order, um, what it's going to do for us, the order of N is going to kind of tighten uh, the, the curvature in here. So as you get to a very high order N, you'll get more of this kind of behavior. A lower one is going to be a little bit more um, lazy. Okay, and then the omega C is going to kind of move this um, back and forth this way. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Um, that's where we're heading anyway. Um, before we dig into exactly how to um, do some of the uh, mathematical mechanics of being able to, to describe um, what order system and all this other stuff, we should probably talk about um, what these different orders are and what they mean in terms of circuits and where they live in the complex plane. So for first order, what we actually have is, uh, this is going to be 180 degrees. Basically, there's a single, uh, singular pole 
that we're going to be working with for that one. And for, for this particular one, what we end up having is a transfer function, h of s is equal to 1 over uh, 1 plus s r c. This should come as really no surprise whatsoever. Omega c here is just equal to 1 over r c, right? Um, and so we end up with a magnitude, not surprisingly, if we plug in 1 uh, in for that n value, which is equal to the square root of 1 plus omega r c squared okay and so what this looks like is um, for the normalized one so if we have if we normalize and recall that normalization is just when we divide out by that omega uh, c value so that we we put everything at a unit right at the um, a unit distance from the origin meaning that our um, our frequency, how far away we are from the origin in the complex plane is equal to 1. Okay, so that's what's going to happen with all our poles. They're all going to sit, uh, for the normalized value, a distance 1 away from the origin. They're just going to be spread out by different angles based on the number of different poles that we have, i.e. based on the order. So, if we normalize, we have omega c is equal to 1, and this gives us uh, 1 over rc is equal to 1, so RC equals one, and we can use some some scaling and stuff like that to uh, to fix stuff for ourselves. So we're not just stuck with R is equal to one ohm and C is equal to, uh, you know, <laughs> just one as well. So, um, yeah, don't don't worry about that. We'll get to that stuff later on in the chapter here. Okay, but effectively what we have is it's just zero from the minus sigma axis. So. Um, hn of s, if you want to call it the normalized version, is just 1 over s plus 1. And for this, what you're going to have, if we do a pole 0 plot, you're just going to have a pole right there. Okay? That's it. And it's going to be distance 1 away for the normalized. That's a Butterworth filter. Okay. So now, uh, if we look at the second order one, what we end up with is something we've already done, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Um, but basically, there's a 90-degree angle between poles, okay? Um, and I should have said between poles here because there is only one pole, and there's 180 degrees, um, if you wanted to think about it that way. But anyway, you're going to split that um, up over uh, however many poles you have. So effectively, for second order, you do 180 divided by 2, right? And you end up with... Uh, 90 degrees between poles, i.e. this is our 45 degree off axis. And we showed what this looked like last time. There's 45 degrees here, 45 degrees here, and we have this magic sweet spot uh, for us when we have two poles interacting with each other, okay? And so this angle right in here is the 90 degrees we're, that we're splitting up, okay? Okay, from here, uh, we showed that uh, we had the, um, let me block this off a little bit here. Oh, where do we, let's see. H J omega magnitude was equal to, uh, this K over, um, the square root of one plus, uh, omega over omega C to the fourth now. Okay. And then if we normalize it, we end up with a, function that looks like this, a transfer function. So we have plus the square root of 2, s plus 1. Okay, this function is very important for us. So this is a good one to have in your back pocket, all right? And uh, the normalized version of this is just h j omega is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 plus omega to the fourth, not surprisingly, right? As, as we normalize everything, um, we expect it to look very similar to um, something as uh, what we had kind of up here, you know, going on. Okay, so that should, uh, this should all be kind of a little bit of review uh, so far. So now what happens when we go up to something like a third order? Oh, by the way, the poles here, um, just to reiterate, uh, are at uh, minus square root of 2 over 2 plus minus square root of 2 over 2 j, Okay. All right, third order. 
So for this one, we do 180 degrees divided by 3, which gets us 60 degrees between all of our poles. With three of them, one of them is going to sit on the axis again. Okay, so we're going to have one here, then we're going to go 60 degrees up, and then 60 degrees down to get our two poles. Okay, this is going to give us the maximally flat behavior for that order of a, uh, a, a passband uh, filter. For our equation for this, for our, our normalized uh, transfer function, is 1 over s squared plus 2s squared plus 2s plus 1. Okay, and if you factored this down here, oops, this should be to the third, sorry about that. If you factored this here, you'd see that those poles for that are going to lie right there uh, at, at the designated spots there on the left in this, in this pole zero plot, okay? Okay, so if you want any higher orders, you can use the same pattern, right? You just kind of divide 180 up and, uh, you know, you'll end up with uh, exactly what you need to get out of it. So in this case, it'd be 45 degrees between everything. Uh, you start, uh, you would start at the center, you know, you'd have 45 degrees here and here, uh, do another 45 degrees between here and here etc. And then wherever these guys would lie is how you would construct your polynomial, okay? So you just use all of those different uh, roots of, of this uh, graphic here, and then you could just build your polynomial straight off of that by multiplying all those roots together. There you are. Um, so, etc. All right. So the meat and potatoes here are these uh, normalized um, transfer functions. That's really what's important here, because those are going to tell you... Um, exactly how the system is kind of uh, constructed. Now for these, there's actually a lot of different options uh, for how to construct um, Butterworth filters, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk about next. So basically it's a single capacitor and a resistor. Um, and we know that the output voltage is taken across the capacitor. In this configuration, the series resistor could be interpreted simply to represent the internal resistance of the source. So, um, Really, all we have here is just the capacitor is what we, what we care about. There's an alternative, though, to doing this. So the ge more generalized version looks more like this, right? It's, it's basically just putting in that uh, a single shunt capacitor. That's really all this is. And uh, so here's the shunt capacitor. We have Vn is over here, plus minus. Uh, and then we have V out on the other side, plus minus. Okay, and then we have some current I in going through here. Um, and then the other way of doing this is with an inductor, as you might guess, um, because of the duality of inductors and capacitors, we can actually develop a first order Butterworth filter using an inductor as well. And so what that looks like is the following. It's got a, just an inductor up top here, some current, um, our input voltage, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> if I, I could use a V there, that'd be nice. Um, <clears throat> we have an input voltage here and an output. And then this is just a single uh, connection through here. Nothing fancy, no resistance, nothing else going on there. And that's it. So these are uh, two different port representations of the first order Butterworth low pass filter configurations. Uh, we have the single shunt capacitor right here. And then uh, we have the... Um, so the single shunt capacitor actually is good for a, uh, a voltage source. All right, so that's good to keep in mind. Um, provided other elements are in series between the source and the filter element, okay? And then on the uh, down here, what we have is a single series inductor, um, and this may be connected directly to a voltage source but requires a shunt element between the current source and the filter element. Okay, so may connected to voltage source, but requires shunt element between current source and filter element. Okay. 
So this is kind of hearkening back to uh, that diagram that we talked about last time where we have this sort of uh, input right coming in and then it's connected via two terminals to our um, our filter whatever our filter design is that's what these two guys are doing for us here and here okay these are just kind of acting as that stand-in um, for our design and then we have ultimately some kind of output and usually our load is going to go uh, in there as well okay so for second order uh, we're going to do something similar um, this should come as no surprise at this point um, but we have two representations for this as well. Um, basically if we have, uh, let me write it up here. Second order, Butterworth circuits, and these should be in your book as well, um, to some effect. So we have, uh, some kind of VN here. And uh, if we have, if we plug this into like a current source, um, a good one for us is going to be having this uh, shunt capacitor here with an inductor. And then our V out just pops off to the side there. Or uh, if we have a voltage source, we can redraw this as. Uh, an inductor right here first, and then we have our V out over here. You put your load right over here on the right in this instance, and then uh, we have some kind of input over here. So we have two representations because our input voltage source cannot be directly across the shunting element, okay? So that's what's going on here effectively. So we have an input voltage source. It can't go right across that capacitor. Otherwise we're gonna have some problems. All right, let's do a th some uh, third order drawings here real quick. So for third order, um, what we're gonna end up with is a VN right here, plus minus, here's our inductor. And then we're gonna have two coming across here, two capacitors, okay. Notice here that the number of inductors and capacitors is directly proportionate to the order of the system. This really shouldn't come as a surprise to us at this point because um, when we look at our pole zero um, plots and how we how we build our, uh, our poles, um, each time dependent element kind of adds an extra root onto that system. Okay, so this really shouldn't come as a surprise. Then V out. So we use this when RS is not equal to zero or our ideal source is a current source. Okay. So basically this is for a current source model. Um, or we can do it this way with two inductors instead, and then just have the one shunt capacitor here, L1, L2, and then a V out, and then a V in. Okay, and then we use this when uh, the ideal input is some kind of voltage source or RS is equal to zero. Okay. And again, we have the same uh, thing for this as well, where if we have a voltage source, we don't want it going directly across uh, that capacitor. Okay. So we need that inductor kind of in the way. Um, all right. That should do it. Um, you can derive what the other circuits would look like based off of um, your, uh, your transfer function, etc. cetera. So um, if you want to derive the fourth order one, I leave that as an exercise. So this is third order, by the way. Uh, probably should label this properly. Oops, come on. Butterworth circuits. 
So basically what we're going to do is we are going to grab one of these circuits and just kind of uh, use the basic element values. So the most simple values we possibly can to make it work. Um, and then we can scale it from there to get the right frequency and magnitude that we need. So we use the, the KF and KM parameters to be able to, to make it look the way we want it to. Because you're not going to have, you know, one ohm resistors and uh, one farad capacitors or one Henry uh, inductors every time you build a circuit, right? You're going to you're gonna want to actually use real elements here. So, um, but as we said before, we build a toy model and then we can adapt it to the realistic thing that we need. Okay, so let's dig into um, going back a little bit here. Let's go back to where we started off here. So going back, now that we kind of know what all these different Butterworths should look like, um, where they come from in the pole zero plot, okay, that's great, but um, I need to know if I set, you know, these blocks here, okay, I, I've, I've picked how much attenuation I want to have by this frequency, and I want to, you know, I want my drop off, my transition to begin at about, you know, omega p, whatever that may be. Well, so if I specify these four parameters, A min, A max, omega p, and omega s, can I get a Butterworth out of it? And what, what all is left over? Well, what's left over is when I determine those four, those four parameters, what it's going to spit out after we do some derivations here is we're going to determine what order of Butterworth that we need to be able to meet that criteria. And then we're also going to figure out what omega c that that circuit design needs to have in order for it to fit in there as well. Okay, where where exactly do we need to shift this guy in order for it to fit between the two brick walls? All right, so the order and uh, is going to be specified first, and then from there we'll figure out how much we need to shift. Okay, so let us begin. We know that the magnitude is inversely proportionate to the attenuation. That's just that just makes sense, right? I mean, of course it is. Um, that's what magnitude is. It's, it's the opposite of loss. It's how much we've, we're retaining. Um, so attenuation is kind of a funny thing. So when we talk about A max, what we're actually referring to here is the maximum value of the... I'm going to go back to that brick wall again one more time. Sorry about that, guys. Um, we're actually referring to the maximum here at omega p. So right before we start to transition, we're not referring to the absolute maximum, right? Which is actually going to be uh, zero loss, right? Because that's with respect to the maximum amount of magnitude that we have. So effectively, a max is quote unquote not a maximum value. Um, it's it's a little bit of a misnomer, right? Because what it is, is it's the maximum value of the transition band, effectively. Okay. So, don't get confused on that point. Um, and again, if you have some questions, you know, just post them up on Piazza. But that's basically what's going on here. So, in order to figure out um, where our order is, the first thing we want to do is establish some kind of relationship between omega p and a max, and omega s and a min. And then we'll kind of uh, take the ratio of omega p and omega s in order to get out that omega c. Okay, so after some derivations uh, and converting this into a sort of decibel scaling, what we end up with is that um, a max has to be less than or equal to 10 times the log base 10 of this internal expression here. We're going to do the same thing uh, with the other side of the uh, the brick wall diagram. Um, but this is easily rewritten here if we um, just kind of raise both sides to, you know, the, uh, from 10 and do a little bit of algebra, we can get a nice version here of omega p over omega c. And that's going to give us something very useful at the end of the day. Um, we can do the same thing here with omega s and a min. Noting here that omega s and a min form the other side of that, uh, the other brick wall, right? They, they form the other two edges, or form the two edges of the other brick wall, excuse me. So, all right, now what we can do is we take these two equations together, 
and we're going to um, divide them out. We take their ratio. And what we end up with, if you look back here, is we're just taking this over over this effectively, right? Or rather, yeah, that's the, that's the direction we're going. We have the, uh, the A min on top here over the A max. And so now we have um, a relationship between the ratio of omega S over omega P, which we set, by the way, right? We set omega S and we set omega P and we set A min and we set A max. So now all that's left as, a, as an indeterminate is N. And so as we isolate N in this expression, what we end up with is this equation right here. And this is, and I put a big exclamation point here. I can't put enough stars next to it. This is the big equation to take away from today. I know the algebra in this is atrocious because of all the logs and stuff, but it's, it's really not that bad. Um, but, you know, it looks, it looks rougher than what it is, really, if, if you haven't played with logs in a while. Um, so, yeah, brought to you by uh, log. So, anyways, um, the big takeaway from this is um, that this gives us an equation for solving the minimum value of n. And the, the, the thing we have to keep in mind here is that if n, if this spits out, you know, 2.5, then we need to go up to a third order because there is no, um, you know, 2.5 order uh, circuit here because we have discrete elements. We can't make uh, non-discrete elements. We can't use half a capacitor or half an inductor. We have to use whole elements here. Um, so make sure you always round up. So my note here, down here, is basically saying that um, although you know, we've picked our omega S, our omega P, our A min, our A max, and, and effectively we're picking an N and an omega C that are within a reasonable bound, okay? We could technically pick an N min that's four here, right? If we had, if this was 2.5, we could say, well, let's go ahead and pick four. That's perfectly acceptable. It'll still meet the criteria, I promise you. But um, we want to try to do it as efficiently as possible too, right? Because you don't just want to be throwing... 15th order filters at every problem that you run across. Um, it's not a very good design. So our filters will live in, in here, okay? They'll live in this, this region of different possible solutions uh, in here. And part of that's based off of this omega C. So omega C is bounded by the following two equations. So if we go back to those other expressions, we can actually um, derive the lower and upper bounds here. And this is a super important note, okay? Um, I cannot stress this enough. If, um, if A max is equal to three decibels, okay? If A max is equal to three decibels, you can just assume that omega C is equal to omega P. Let's say it one more time because it's really important. If A max, if you've set A max equal to three decibels, okay, then you can just assume that omega C is equal to omega P. Okay. So that's, that's nice. Um, basically, what that's telling us is that um, the order uh, is going to pick us up over top of the right-hand side of that brick wall diagram. Okay, so if we have a situation where omega P is not equal to omega C, which is going to be you know, a good chunk of the time, um, we can use this equation to bound our possibilities for uh, the min and max of omega C. A uh, typo in the book, uh, just draw your attention real quick. Uh, this guy uh, says A max in the, in the book there. It's supposed to say A min. Okay, so don't, don't uh, mess that up. Okay, so here's our general procedure. We're going to determine the needed order, N, um, and this will determine the overall design of the circuit, right? It's going to determine how many inductors and capacitors we have. And the type of input that we have, effectively, if it's like a current source or a voltage source, is going to determine which version of the Butterworth circuit that we're going to use. Um, then we're going to pick an omega C within bounds, okay, if it's possible to, to find an appropriate one. Um, and then from there, what we're going to do is a, apply omega C and the order to generate the actual circuit, but it's going to be a normalized circuit, okay? So we're going to have ones with kind of those dummy values in there. And then once we have the dummy value circuit set up, then we just scale everything by KM and KF as needed. And we've done frequency and magnitude scaling already, so this should be no trouble for us at all. We're pros at that. Um, so 
what's nice about this procedure is that if we memorize the basic element values for normalized circuits, then you know this this is just a piece of cake from from here forward. Okay, so it really becomes pretty easy for us. Okay, so there are many ways for us to meet the requirements of uh, a Butterworth filter or a Butterworth transfer function. Okay, so there's a lot of different circuit designs, and we've talked about this already. Um, but what I want to go do real quick is go through the different circuit designs that we have at our disposal. We call these uh, topologies, actually. And uh, the thing about the topologies is... Or, okay, well, let's start with this. Okay, that's all topology means. It's just a fancy word for the study of surfaces. Um, but the one we're going to be working with today primarily is, and I hope I'm spelling or I'm uh, saying this correctly, the Cower uh, topology. And then later we'll be looking at, uh, we'll see active topologies, uh, such as Salen and key. Um, and, and these kind of other topologies that are out there are going to be using other elements that we're familiar with, like MOSFETs and, and op amps. Okay. So you can actually generate, um, filters that meet these criteria, these, um, maximally flat criterias, i.e. they have a, a nice transfer function that we want with different types of circuits. And we've already seen that there's different types of circuits, even within uh, a given topology. So there you go. All right. So now what I want to do is go through the derivations that are in the book a little bit um, and kind of show you guys how to get those normalized those normalized uh, circuits out, okay? So that you have something to work with or, or sort of a baseline to jump off from. All right, so for the first one, for first order, we have... Our transfer function is V out, S over V in of S. And we used uh, this simple model here. We had a resistor and then a capacitor here. Okay. And our V out was taken over that capacitor. We just called this RS. This was C. And so for this one, uh, it's pretty easy to tell that it, this is just 1 over RC, S plus 1 over RC. We've seen this uh, a number of times. Um, but to match the normalized version, so the normalized transfer function that we that we derived um, is of the following form. It looks like HS is equal to 1 over S plus 1. Okay, and the reason that this is normalized and that's nice is that if I plug in 0, I get 1 as an output. Okay, and generally speaking, that's uh, going to be nice and true for us. And, Normalize usually means that it has something to do with the number one. <laughs> As a good math rule of thumb, okay, um, it's going to be a unit of something. That's that's all normalize does. So in order to meet this criteria, um, to get this, we just let RC equal one. Well, there's a lot of ways that we can... Uh, that we can let RC equal one, right? There's an infinite number of ways, but for all intents and purposes, we can just start out with R is equal to one ohm and C is equal to one farad. And then from there, what we do is we just say, well, we'll just scale our resistor or capacitor accordingly um, based on what we need at the end of the day, okay? Now, supposing that we instead use the other uh, version of this that we showed you, uh, if we had just this, you know, the little inductor on top there, the little inductor that could. <laughs> and uh, here we go. We had this going on. V out. Okay. And then for this one, the transfer function looks something like V out, V in. It shouldn't come as a surprise, I hope. Um, be careful with your casing here. Sorry about that. This is capital V, capital V down here. So if we use an inductor in series with a load, okay? Um, so we have some kind of load out here. 
okay, then we end up with our transfer function, sorry, I got a little crowded there, is equal to this, okay? So what you can do for this particular instance is you just say, well, I want the same, the same thing here, right, for the normalized version. So this just implies that RL is equal to L, okay? And so you could just set your, your normalized version as 1 ohm and L is equal to 1 uh, Henry. And again, you would just scale from there to get the effective circuit that you want, okay? All right, so let's talk about second order. Okay, so our V out has taken over that uh, load resistor. And then if we do some nodal analysis here, uh, what we end up with is the following equation. Okay, and we can actually simplify this quite a bit to get our transfer function out, which is 1 over LC over S squared, S squared plus 1 over RLC times S plus 1 over LC. Uh, this is where it starts to get kind of interesting. So once you, once you start to build circuits, right, that you know meet the right topology that you want or... or have the right requirements or something. And you want to try to start to um, make these behave in a uh, optimal fashion. What you need to do is set this equal to that normalized version, right? So what does the normalized version of the second order filter look like? Well, we know what it looks like. It's one over S squared plus the square root of two S plus uh, plus one, right? And notice here that an input of zero gives us an output of one. So what I need from this then is I need the following criteria to be met. I need uh, LC needs to be equal to one and RL uh, times C needs to be equal to the square root of two. So you can see that based on the coefficient. So the easiest way to do this then is just to say, well, um, oh, I'm sorry, this should be one over the square root of two. <laughs> Um, but the easiest way to do this then is just to let uh, RL equal to 1 ohm. And then from there, the other two are determined. Uh, we just have C is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 farads. And uh, our inductor is equal to the square root of 2 Henry's, okay? And this becomes our normalized uh, Butterworth circuit design for this particular topology. And again, it, you know, you're not going to have these particular values in here, but the idea here is that you, you have this normalized version now, and you can use this normalized version to, um, you know, scale it or scale it in magnitude, scale it in frequency to get the kind of, uh, filter behavior that you want out of it and, and to be able to incorporate realistic elements in there as well. We're going to use the, uh, T realization of the, um, uh, the uh, coward topology, okay, for the third order. All right, so what we have here, and as we mentioned before, there are other ways to organize this. Uh, you'll just have a slightly different transfer function. You'll have to come up with a different normalization, which you will then have to scale and use, uh, depending on if you have you know some kind of different input, some kind of other load restrictions, whatever. Okay, so for a uh, for current source, uh, the shunt capacitor should be separated by a single series inductor and a pi configuration. So to note here, this is a T configuration, right? And a pi configuration just looks like the letter pi, kind of. And so your inductor would go in here, and then your capacitor, you know, your two shunt capacitors would live there. And then maybe this is some kind of, like, nether portal or something. I don't know. Maybe it's Stargate SG-1 or something. I don't know. Anywho, um... Let's go ahead and derive the uh, from the nodal analysis here. This is a VN. Uh, what we're going to end up with... Oh, sorry, V out is over here, in case it wasn't clear. Doing a little bit of uh, analysis here, we can 
uh, simplify things using VCS is equal to V out times one plus S L two over R L. And we plug this back through and, and I'm going to skip quite a number of steps here because I just want to get to the end of this. Uh, v out of S, you can look in the book for it, over V in of S is equal to, okay. And you can simplify this even further. And that's going to be the, the transfer function here for this circuit. Now as a homework, okay, and this is probably more valuable than some of the other homework problems that are in there to a certain extent. Um, there's some really good ones in the in the homework problem set, which I'll, I'll talk about hopefully um, by the end of the next chapter here. Um, but I want you guys to look at this for the, uh, the pi configuration. Okay, so that's that'd be a good exercise for you. It'll help you build this up. And then when you get to the end here, what do we do uh, to get the normalized version? Well, um, it's the same as what we did the last couple times, right? We know that RL over L1, L2C must be equal to one. And then we know that these coefficients here and here have to be equal to two and two. And then this last one has to be equal to one as well. Well, that's nice because we already knew that that had to be equal to one. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, so all we really have to worry about is setting uh, those other two guys uh, equal to uh, two. And yeah, you do a little bit of algebra. Um, the, you know, there's not, you know, unique solutions to this necessarily because uh, you can scale stuff, right? That's the whole point. Um, but to get a simple version here, uh, what you end up with is the following. So let me write out this stuff here so you can have it for reference. Uh, is equal to two and one over C, one over L1 plus one over L2 is equal to two as well. So what we end up with here is uh, L2 equal to one half and then uh, L1 is equal to three over two and C is equal to uh, four over three and this is just in straight up Farad's and Henry's, okay? And we we start off with the, the assumption here, and it's generally easiest to do this, by the way, is just assume that your resistors, uh, RL and then RS, if you have an RS in here, okay? Just assume that those are equal to one when you're developing your normalized version for these filters, okay? So actually, we're going to use this in the, in the next example that we're going to do here, okay? And that's going to help us out... Um, for trying to build an actual no kidding circuit that meets the Butterworth filter um, requirement that we're trying to look for. So we have an example here. Uh, this one's not in the book. So what we have here to start off is uh, we've specified a min and a max and our two omega values. And then we're going to set our order n, right? It's gonna determine how tight this thing is. And we're also going to set our omega C based on certain uh, parameters or certain thresholds that we, that we developed through our equations. So we go ahead and we start off with just our equation that we have from before. We plug in our values. It's very straightforward. You should be able to do this. Uh, we end up with uh, 2.116-ish, and uh, it's got to be greater than that. So our filter order must be at least third order or higher. Now let's figure out exactly what uh, our omega C value is going to be. Well, again, we have two handy equations. We have the right and left hand side are two bounds here. So we have uh, on the left side, we're bounded by about 100 radians per second. It's actually 109. And then it's just over uh, 200 radians per second um, at 215. So, you know, we have some options in here. We can kind of pick whatever we want that's convenient. We could actually pick um, 100 and 50 or 200, you know, whatever numbers kind of work nicely for you and work with the components that you have that you think would uh, work out nicely. And you can adjust it as needed too. Um, again, the omega C here is not really, all it's doing is it's guiding which possible, um, which possible line we're following, you know, in that brick wall diagram. If we meet the requirements, it doesn't matter where we fall within the spectrum as long as we're between 
these two uh, blockades, okay? That's it. So everything else is at our convenience. Aha, all that work we did, right? We have the normalized Butterworth filter of the third order. And now all we're going to do is we just then use magnitude and frequency scaling to make omega C fit where we want it to, okay? And uh, we're going to get into that a little bit more later on, this, this whole process, because I want to dig into another example of how to set this up first. And when we get into the high-pass filter stuff, we're going to come right back to this problem again. So I'm going to just table this for right now, and I promise we will touch on it again, okay? So let's do another example just to get get you through the setup part, okay? We're getting through the setup part. Here's our brick wall diagram. I give you this. You should be able to draw this easily, okay? Every time. You should recognize what's going on here and, and how to set it up, especially if I even tell you it's a low-pass filter, okay? A uh, high-pass filter, obviously, is just going to be flipped this direction, right? Because you want things to pass up here and not be uh, attenuated. All right. So from here, uh, we just follow the same equations like we did before, and what we end up with is n is greater than or equal to one half of this log expression, and we're looking at the ratio here. So the ratio is, um, it's just like a hundred, right? So you can actually do some shortcuts here because you know that this is just equal to two log base ten of a hundred is just two, right? Um, so do use shortcuts when you're doing this. That'll also help you. Um, from making calculator errors. I would rather you guys just round off and give me a round number that's close um, than, you know, give me a fat fingered number that makes no sense at all. Okay, so what we end up with here is uh, it's around, we get around five over four. So this implies that N has to be equal to two or higher. Okay, we're gonna pick two because that's easier. Uh, for omega C, well, omega C here, what do we say? A max is equal to 3 dB means we can use omega C equal to omega P is just fine. 3 dB. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, pff, we're done with that part. Now what do we got to do? We got to do the circuit realization. Okay, so let's do that. So for second order, we have two options, right? For the for the kind of topologies we've explored so far. We have this one where the shunt capacitor happens first. And we have the one where the shunt capacitor happens after. Okay. So which is it going to be? Well, we can't really ignore... Uh, load or source as coupling capacitors are not used with passive filtering. Okay, so one common assumption here is that we're going to We're going to build this model here We got our filter We have a load and uh, We're just going to say that RS is equal to RL is equal to 1 omega or, or 1 ohm <laughs> 1 omega <laughs> too many omegas floating around guys um, and we're going to use this in conjunction with a normalized design. Okay. And for this one, we're going to go ahead and since we have this RS is not equal to zero, we'll go ahead and use this one here. Should be no problem at all. Okay. So we have, uh, here's our one ohm. Since I'm losing my mind, <laughs> I'm wanting to call them one omegas now. Oh boy, uh, too many letters, too many things floating around. I need a vacation, you guys. Send me, send me on a vacation to to the pizza roll factory. There we go. That'd be lovely. All right, so here's our normalized one. We we already kind of derived this uh, from before, right? We we know what this should be. Uh, one omega here. Um, if you want to, we can uh, solve this out. Did we do this one? I can't remember. I thought we did. We did. Okay, so there's that. Let's see what we had here. Oh, we didn't do this one. We did the one where the uh, where the inductor's up front. So 
let's go ahead and derive this one, shall we? Uh, I think you'll find that it's eerily similar to uh, what I just wrote. So let's go ahead and derive this real quick. Um, when we analyze this system, what we end up with is the following. Uh, we have an equation that looks like, and I, I guess I'll, uh, as an exercise, um, try to get to this point with your uh, transfer function derivation. Okay. And in this case, we're using Vs because this is, uh, we're going to call this Vs over here. Okay. And this is equal to RL over LCRS. And what we end up with is S squared plus RL over L plus 1 over RSC. S plus 1 over LC plus RL over LCRS. Okay. So now all we do is we play the matchy-matchy game, and uh, what we want here, we want this guy to equal 1, ideally, right? So that could be a bit of an issue. Uh, why don't we start out with the bottom part? We know RL over L plus 1 over RS. C is equal to square root of 2. We know that RS and RL are equal to 1, so we have 1 over L plus 1 over C is equal to square root of 2. Um, so L is equal to C is equal to the square root of two easy. And then, uh, we also know that this has to be equal to one, right? So we know that, uh, L times C or excuse me, one over, uh, LC is equal to one half. So this is going to be one half plus, um, another one half, right? So that's, that's easy. This is equal to 1. That checks out this whole expression here. So we're good. Uh, we Just to double check here, let's look up here and see what we got going on. Uh, we got ooh, 1 over... Ooh, this is actually half. Uh-oh. What are we going to do about that? We have a little bit of a problem. So our normalized circuit here is a little goofy. We've kind of got a, got an issue we got we have to solve here. So how do we do this? Well, um, what if we try to uh, apply a magnitude scaling? Okay, we try to apply a KM. So RL over LC RS. We have a KM that's going to apply to that. Uh, top resistor there. We have a KM LC over KM. Remember that uh, we do the inverse operation, multiplication or division, for inductors versus capacitors for um, magnitude scaling. So this is just going along for the ride uh, underneath the C here. And then another KM gets attached to RS down here. Okay, so uh, we do this. If we did a magnitude scaling, these two would cancel. These two, oh. So, unfortunately, a magnitude scaling won't. Magnitude scaling won't fix this. Okay, so that's a little bit of an issue. Um, what about uh, the denominator effect of Km? Maybe something will happen up there. So if we look at RL over L plus 1 over RSC, <clears throat> we're looking at this, this part right here now. And uh, if we do that down there, this is a square root of 2. If we did some scaling on that guy, then this becomes... Uh, KM RL over uh, KM L. So those two would cancel out. And then we also have one over KM RS, C over KM. Uh, those two would cancel out. So no effect on that one. It's just fine. Um, and then as it turns out, the last term here is also unaffected by magnitude scaling too. Okay, so what's the upshot here? What, what am I actually trying to get to here at the end of the day? Um, well, basically, we're stuck with one-half factor here. 
Ah, that's annoying. But is it the end of the world? Well, no, actually, all this is is we just need to put um, some kind of amplifier on this after the fact. Uh, it's not a big deal. This is just life, all right? So we're just going to have to get over it and um, deal with the problem the best that we can. So this is one of those times when the mathematics does not uh, make you know, a perfect solution here. You have to engineer the solution after the fact. Um, but this is no big deal, right? We have amplifiers, and so we can get that signal gain uh, back up. And effectively, that's what's happening with the transfer function is, is the magnitude is going down by, uh, well, the, uh, the transfer function uh, has a scaling factor attached to it of this one half that we can address afterwards. So anyways, um, that's the long short of it. Next part of this problem, however, is more important and it is something that we can address. And that has to do with the frequency aspect of this. So what about omega c because right now our omega c for this circuit right here is equal to one right we, we we've seen that it's a normalized circuit right so it's got to be equal to one so we need to change take omega c from one radian per second which is a little bit slow and take it to uh what do we say 200 200 radians per second which was our omega p. Okay, so our uh, kf factor here is equal to 200. And so when I do this, I know that l nu is equal to l old. It's a weird way to write an l. Okay. Over kf. So go square root of 2 over 200. And c nu is equal to C old. Which is just square root of 2 over 200. So recall that we scale these the same way for frequency scaling. Okay? Between inductors and capacitors. And then our new circuit looks like this. RS. RL, and I have square root of 2 over 200 farads, and square root of 2 over 200 henrys, okay? Now, right now, these are equal to 1 ohm and 1 ohm. If we want a target, uh, RS, let me not use a division symbol, or RL, um, then we just use the magnitude scaling to achieve that, okay? All right, guys, that's going to do it for this chapter, I think. Uh, let's look at the homework real quick. So the focus for the homework here, things I want you to be looking for. I want you to be able to plot the brick wall diagram. That's really straightforward, okay? I want you to be able to draw brick walls. That's really, really simple. Um, I want you to be able to solve for normalized values of R, C, L in uh, various circuit solutions. What I mean by that is the kind of stuff that we were just doing where we're looking at those equations in here, right? And we're saying, okay, this is the equation. My normalized uh, equation has 1 over s squared plus 2s plus 2 plus 1. How do I make these two things line up? This is a simple algebra problem. I want you guys to be able to do that simple algebra problem, okay? And uh, other things to look for in here. Honestly, it looks like it looks like problem three and four are really your meat and potatoes here. So definitely, definitely work on these, okay? And you'll be in you'll you should be in really good shape for the quiz if you can do those. Alright? And can do this other stuff. Okay, that's gonna do it. Thanks all. Okay, gang. 
Uh, chapter 34 here. I'm going to try to do this quickly so I can justify squishing it together with um, the other Better Worth chapter. But anyways, this chapter is really simple. It has one equation attached to it. You ready for it, kids? Here we go. Omega is equal to omega p over omega. That's it. All right. That's the whole chapter. You can go home now. We're done. Uh, I wish it was that simple. It is actually just about that simple, though. Let's take a look. So we should know by now, after having seen a bajillion brick walls um, and smashing our faces into them repeatedly, which is pretty much the summary of my professional career, by the way, um, and not breaking through, but you just have this for a brick wall diagram for a high pass filter then should, should come as no surprise, right? This is just the inverse of, um, the inverse of our low pass filter. And as per usual, we have some frequency here, some frequency here, and these are switched, right? Switched. Why? Well, because this is where the passing starts, right? This is loss or lossiness. So oh, here we go. This is our, uh, this is our stop. Oops. Our stop band. This is our pass band. And, uh, so all the frequencies down here don't go. All the frequencies here are good to go. Now we know how to solve low pass filters, right? So if we were going to solve this thing, wouldn't it be nice if we could just turn this into some kind of low pass filter and then just solve it from there? Well, as it turns out, it's your lucky day and that's exactly what we're going to do. This is actually a low pass filter in disguise. We're gonna use a substitution. That's right. All right, you can come out for this one, Naruto. It's fine. You know what? You've earned it. Okay. You know, honestly, I really haven't seen... Well, I've probably seen more of that show than I should. Because any of seeing that show is too much. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> all, all the Naruto fanboys are going to are gonna be roasting me on the, on the YouTubes here. Alright, so we have our A-Max here. Our A-Min here. And the way we transform this guy is a little weird. Okay, so we're going to define a new axis. We're going to call this new axis the, no surprise, it was omega. It's now going to become the omega axis. Yes, if that wasn't confusing enough, let me confuse you a little further. This point here, the value of omega at this point, we're going to call this omega p. Because, again, we're switching between a low pass and a high pass, so version, oops, that's not how you spell version, version of high pass filter. Okay, so this should be a P. And using our handy dandy gigantic equation here, uh, we're basically just going to plug this in and we end up with omega P over omega P, which is equal to, by the way, in case you were confused, the number one. So we've transformed this into a sort of a normalized low pass filter. That's all we've really done. Uh, we've just put the thing on its head. And literally, quite literally, because this was our variable in question, and so we flipped it over on its head. And that gives us a, gets us a low-pass filter, which is pretty cool. Um, so what's this one become, then? Well, it really shouldn't come as a surprise, but um, Omega S here, this, uh, this stop band for our low-pass filter equivalency, our, our version here, is Omega P, this constant, over Omega S. Okay, so basically all you got to do is you take whatever, okay, take the given omega P and omega S and create a low pass filter version where the new, the new quote unquote capital omega p is equal to one and the new quote unquote capital omega s is equal to the old omega p over omega s okay where the old 
that I'm referring to here are these two, the ones that you're given from the high pass. All right. And then from there, we just use the same equations that we know and love to be able to do things. So for example, for high pass filter order calculation, what do we have? Well, we have just, this has to be greater than or equal to one half log base 10 of 10 to the 0 0.1 a min, oops, that's none of that, minus 1 over 0 0.1 a max, okay, cool, minus 1, and then over the log of 10 of, uh, what do I put in here? Oh, well, I'm doing things with respect to big omega now, so I might as well do big omega s over big omega p, and so this actually just becomes, as you might guess, omega p and omega s here, well, I just take omega p over omega s. So I'm just taking the reciprocal here of what I had before. So this is omega p over omega omega s, okay? So it's really straightforward, you guys. It's not, it's not hard using substitution, okay? Now, to calculate the new corner frequencies, um, things are also pretty straightforward. We just substitute in. Here we go. How to find the new corner frequencies. We just substitute in the capital omega P S framework, and that's going to give us what we need. So we have omega C min is equal to omega P, which by the way is just equal to one. So I'm just going to write a one here. Two N over the square root of 10 to the 0 0.1 a max minus one less than or equal to omega C, less than or equal to omega S over 2N, the 2nth root of 10, 0 0.1, a min, all minus 1, and that's equal to my omega C max. Okay, so we basically find our, um, our anchoring parameter here, big omega C, uh, by the exact same equation that we had before. Okay? So as with uh, low-pass filters, we solve for n, then uh, get a range on omega c, pick one, that's nice, okay, then scale kf km as needed. So we actually need to, once we get this low pass filter circuit, then we have to take it back and turn it into uh, a high pass filter circuit. That may sound like a pain, but actually it's really easy. So here's what you do. R goes to R. Alrighty. To convert L and C, what you're gonna do is you take your inductor here and you turn it into a capacitor. And the, the value of the capacitor is omega P times L in the denominator. And for the capacitor, you just take this and you turn it into an inductor. And the value of that inductor is one over omega P times C. That's it. Low pass filter, high pass filter. Okay, and these stay the same. Pretty straightforward. Omega is equal to omega P over omega. So any S's, any frequencies that you have go likewise. So yeah, pretty straightforward. If you need a little bit more detail here, L is defined as for the impedance uh, as S times L, which gets you omega P L over S, which is equal to one over S over omega P L. Hence why we get this. Because it's basically a capacitor at that point, right? Okay, and then C, uh, similarly one over S C, 
this is ZC now, if we convert it uh, using this equation here, which is pretty neat, omega PC, well, this is actually just, this looks just like ZL, right? Or ZL is defined as uh, 1 over omega PC. Okay, so that should make some deal of sense here. So yeah, just switch out your inductors and capacitors, kids, and uh, use the appropriately scaled versions of them. And as you've already done your magnitude and frequency scaling, you don't need to do that. You just need to convert the circuit over. So you're good to go. Let's come back to a, a third order example here. And this is kind of the one that we did from the last chapter. It's a slightly different, um, but that's okay. It's close enough. So we have a brick wall diagram here. Oh, okay. There we are. This is for a high pass filter. And uh, our criteria are 2 dB for our um, our A max, our A min is equal to 40 dB. Uh, omega S is equal to 200 pi. And omega P is equal to 2000 pi's mm, pi. Okay, and this is on the omega axis. So we need to convert this to a uh, low pass filter problem. So omega is equal to, we'll just plug it in here, 2000 pi's over omega. And so when I redraw this brick wall diagram, what do I end up with? Well, I have something like this to start off with, right? Because it's a low pass. My axis, let me do this a little neater. My axis becomes the capital omega axis. We know that this is equal to one, right? Where this is omega P over omega P is equal to omega P. Okay, well then. And then we have this one here is just equal to capital omega S, which is a little bit more complicated. It's going to be uh, plugging in this expression here. Omega S is equal to 2000 pi over omega s, little omega s, right? So we have 200 pi, which just gets me uh, 10. So 1 to 10, easy, on the big omega axis. And this here stays at 2 dB. And let me use the same colors just so we be consistent. 2 dB and 40 dB. Okay. And that 40 dB runs right there. So, in case it wasn't clear, the, the 2 dB runs into that guy there. Sorry about that. All right. Okay, so now all we got to do is just uh, run our stuff through here. We know about the ratio of omega, big omega P and big omega S, um, so our equation is actually pretty simple to solve through. Um, let's do the order first log base 10 of yada 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 what's about as eh, two point something 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 so we end up with n is equal to three okay so it's a third order filter all right so we let's design our little third order filter here Okay, so that's our normalized uh, filter equation. We had we got this out of uh, that circuit out of that. Uh, our C min here is equal to one over sixth root of minus one. So it's something on the order of you know. So we'll pick this as. Omega C. And let's go ahead and make a normalized LPF solution. So we end up here with uh, a new new version, a new rendition of this guy. 
1 over 2 kf with the frequency scale, 4 thirds kf here, and this just becomes 3 over 2 kf down here. Okay, and we can just plug this in. All right, so we do note that KF is equal to omega C. Conveniently here, because why? Well, uh, it's equal to omega C because we started off with, looking back here, an omega P equal to 1. And so when we look at the relationship or the ratio between omega P and omega C, well, uh, since omega P is equal to 1, we just use this effectively as our scaling factor. So it's really convenient for us to be able to use this capital omega notation. And in general, you can pretty much do this if you, if you follow the template here. Okay, so now we got to convert this to a high-pass filter. How do we do that? Um, well, we just use the equations that we have from before, okay? Okay, let's do a little eraser mechanics here. I know you guys are going to hate this, but that's the way it goes. So we're going to get rid of this capacitor. And why don't I go ahead and bring these equations over, just so we have them. Okay, so for our was a capacitor was a capacitor now is an inductor it's going to be one over the previous value so we're going to take the reciprocal of this so now it's 2kf in the numerator and then divide that by uh, omega p as well so this is effectively one over c uh one over omega p times c right and this becomes a inductor similarly here we just get rid of this capacitor plug in an inductor, we take its reciprocal, 2kf over 3, and we stuff an omega p down in the denominator. And we probably should make this green too. What the hey? There we are. Okay, uh, same thing here. Uh, we're just going to look at the inductor, and we take the reciprocal and stuff a uh, omega p down in the denominator. All right, so we go ahead and get rid of this inductor. Let's take the reciprocal of this guy here. So it's 3kf over 4. 3kf over 4. Noting here that kf is uh, going to be accounted for us um, by whatever our, our scale factor was. We already figured that out, right? And uh, we draw in a capacitor here. Whoop. And we got stuff in omega p down in the denominator. We're done. That's it. This is our high pass filter. Cool. And it's got the right omega P. It's got the right omega S. Um, life is good. Does what we want it to. Whatever. Anyways, that'll do it for now, guys. Thanks.